Next up, we have panel A called Politics, Privacy, and Ethics in Digital Collections. Elizabeth Duclos Orsella will be moderating this session. Elizabeth, the digital floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Liz Duclos Orsello, and it is absolutely wonderful to be with all of you today as we kick off this first morning panel and continue the conversation begun in that amazing, amazing keynote. Our panel today dives deeply into the heart of so much of what we do and so much that was just discussed and explored in the keynote and the Q&A. That is considering the ethical and legal aspects of our work. Well, traditional collection development, development has always been fraught with questions of relevance, appropriateness, and selection bias. The awesome power of the internet has made the process even thornier for creating digital collections. This panel will attempt to address difficult questions in digitization and collection building from legal, practical, and ethical perspectives. Some logistics for everyone. During the first half of our session, each panelist will offer a 10 minute overview of a specific challenge they currently face, and then will engage one another in responding to a question from me in order to draw some links and lines between and among their particular case studies. We're going to keep the last 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes or so of our hour for Q&A with all of you, the audience. And I know there are over 400 of you out there. So please make sure that you type your questions into the, the Q&A box and our wonderful moderators will be gathering those and getting them to us so that we can respond. Please note two, two bits. I will be controlling all the slides for this panel. So you will hear panelists um, ask me to move their slides along. And I will introduce each of our three panelists just immediately prior to their presentations. So with no further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our first panelist. And I am just trying, there we are. Our first panelist, Eben English who currently serves as Digital Repository Services Manager at the Boston Public Library. Eben is the main technical lead for the Digital Commonwealth Repository System. He holds an MLIS from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And I will hand this over to Eben. Thanks, Liz. Um, thanks everybody for joining us this morning. Um, I wanna say thanks to the conference committee again for making today happen. And definitely another thanks to Elaine Westbrooks for that amazing keynote. Um, I'm gonna be talking today about ethics of digitizing sensitive content. And I wanna give a little warning before we get started that this presentation does contain several images showing graphic depictions of violence and uh, racially offensive material. Um, I also wanna acknowledge that I'm a white cis man uh, and I benefit from the privilege that my identity provides uh, and I acknowledge that that gives me some protection from the harm that these materials uh, that I'm presenting in this talk can do. Um, I'm certainly not here to present myself as an authority with all the answers or, or with all the, the prescriptions. Um, I'm here to be part of the conversation. I'm here to listen just like everybody else. Um, so uh, next slide please. So when we're talking about the intersection of uh, ethics, privacy, and politics in digital collections, I think that um, the case of Ralph Northam is probably a, a great example to look at. So last year, uh, last February, a picture from Northam's med school yearbook from 1984 surfaced um, where he is, to, he is in blackface. Um, and aside from the political scandal that this uh, generated, it also caused everybody to, to kind of run to the books and see what else is out there. And, Basically what people found is that this kind of content, um, these types of stereotypes and, and offensive imagery are, are all over the place uh, in people's yearbooks from 
Ivy League colleges, liberal arts colleges, um, all, and all over the country, not just in the South by any means. Um, and so that led to uh, a lot of college administrators, library administrators, ordering archives and libraries to review their materials, review their yearbooks. And in certain cases, it led to um, administrators uh, mandating takedown requests for online content uh, within, that was posted in archives and libraries. Uh, and then the inevitable pushback and, and the retractions of those takedown requests. Um, so I think that what this illustrates is uh, A, that this content is a lot more widespread than you might think, um, and that it's not something that only exists in the South, or you know, it's, it's a problem that we all uh, have to deal with. Um, next slide, please. So when I'm talking about sensitive content, I'm, I'm really talking about a lot of different types of things. Uh, we could be talking about explicit content that shows nudity or, or sexual imagery, or graphic violence. Next slide, please. We could be talking about offensive content that's uh, racist, you know, cont uh, contains hate speech, or other types of, of what I call discriminatory content, which is basically just derogatory depictions um, based on identity characteristics like race, gender, religion, um, those types of things. Uh, next slide, please. And I think there's another um, type of content that I would also consider to be sensitive, which is problematic content where the provenance of the materials is unclear. Uh, this especially applies to um, objects or, or materials from indigenous cultures in our, in our digital collections. Um, items where the consent of the people depicted or, or their, uh, the people who are the creators of the work is unclear. Um, materials that are uh, culturally insensitive and that they were never intended to be viewed in any other type of context um, or that are intentionally false or misleading. Um, if we're talking about things like climate change denial, Holocaust denial, uh, that types of those types of materials. Um, next slide, please. So I think that we need to think about, um, you know, what, what, why we need an ethical approach to this material because we have to realize that the content has consequences and that there's real potential for harm in making this available. And I'm not talking about the harm to the political careers of aspiring governors. Um, I'm talking about the harm to the people whose identities or cultures or uh, safety is threatened by the materials that we have in, this, in our archives. Um, and obviously, when we're disseminating this stuff online, uh, we're raising the stakes immensely. Um, I think the quote down at the bottom, um, I like this quote, is it talks about uh, making available materials of textual and visual violence. I really like that phrase because I think it's really appropriate. Um, and when we uh, are making this available, we're really running the risk of perpetuating systems um, and beliefs and, and societal problems that we aspire to replace as libraries, as, as uh, democratic institutions in our society. Next slide, please. So we have to acknowledge that we have a responsibility um, when it comes to dealing with this content. And I think this especially applies to our practices of selection, description, and online dissemination. Um, we need to take an approach that actively solicits input from the communities that are, are most affected by this content. And, and that's a big issue in libraries where our, our uh, staff and our, our um, librarianship is so white. Um, we don't have great representation of, of um, non-white people in our institutions. Um, we need to be informed by an awareness of race, gender, and class uh, in our practice. We need to acknowledge our history of colonialism, oppression, violence, and inequality. Um, I really liked uh, the, the phrase in the keynote about Jim Crow archives. Um, you know, we need to acknowledge that, we, that our archives are a product of our society, which has largely been um, affected by segregation and inequality. And so we can't just treat these materials the same way that we would have, uh, you know, 40 years ago or 30 years ago or even 20 years ago. I think that we need an approach that's grounded in social justice principles like anti-racism, feminism, inclusivity, and, and especially consent. And we need to contextualize the materials within those frames of reference. And so I want to dig a little bit deeper into this process of contextualization. Next slide, please. So what is context? Um, we're most familiar with the, the, the idea of context 
in the form of metadata that we create to accompany the items. And so we create metadata that describes the provenance and the history of the items, um, their purpose, their intended audience, uh, the chain of ownership that signifies their authenticity. Uh, those are all very standard practices that we're comfortable with as archivists and librarians, I think. Um, but I think we also need to consider more deeply the social, political, economic, and artistic uh, origins of the material that we create. And this is where I think people get a little bit more uncomfortable um, you know, when people say, well, I'm, not an, I'm, a, I'm an archivist, I'm not a historian, or I'm, I'm a librarian, I'm not a sociologist. Um, that may be true, but there are elements of history and sociology in everything that we do. Uh, and we need to acknowledge the importance of those aspects of our profession when we deal with this type of content. And um, really, all we're doing is trying to provide users with the tools that they, they need to be able to make sense of this content, to understand what it really means. Um, next slide, please. And that's really not very different from another effort that we're already um, doing, which is basically information literacy. Um, we, are, we are very comfortable with this idea of that it's the library's job to help people understand information and to teach them how to make sense of the information, especially the information that they're finding online. And so I think connecting that expanded descriptive practice to this, the, the, the practice of information literacy instruction is really key. Is they're they're not they're not very different. I think. Um, next slide, please. So I want to just uh, give a few examples of uh, contextualization that I've found uh, in online digital repositories. Um, so you have things like repository level statements. Here are two examples from Temple and Swarthmore. Um, basically, a repository level statement just is a a page or or some kind of text somewhere on your digital repository website or library website that um, you know, provides some context about your practice. Uh, here they're talking about language used in cataloging. Next slide, please. We also have collection level statements. Uh, There's an example from University of Nebraska yearbooks and the Digital Commonwealth Trade, 19th century trade cards um, collection. So these are basically uh, statements that appear on a collection page that in these cases give some kind of content warning about uh, racist imagery that exists and, and why the material is uh, available in this collection. Next slide, please. And we also have item level statements. So these are statements that are, appear on the item level, at the, on the item detail page itself. And I'm sorry that these are kind of hard to read uh, in this presentation, but the example on the left, the, the NC State digital collections, they're actually putting that content warning on every single item in their repository, regardless of the content. Uh, and on, on the right, we see an example where it's much more tailored to the specific item, and there's a, a pretty lengthy description and even a link to a libguide about the history of blackface and, and talking about work that's going on in the university um, in, in relation to reconciliation about that stuff. Um, next slide, please. So I think that if we want to talk about maybe some best practices for, for providing context and digital collection, I think that my personal feeling is that, that these uh, contextualizations need to accompany the content as closely as possible. The repository level and the collection level are, are good to have, but the likelihood that users are going to see those is, is actually kind of low. Um, we need to take responsibility uh, for, the, for the existence of the content and, and acknowledge its offensiveness, uh, frankly, and we need to give context and rationale for why it, it appears and why we're making it available. And I think that that gives us an opportunity to uh, connect to our uh, connect users to our mission and our values and to say, look, we don't agree with the opinions expressed here. This doesn't represent our values, but this is part of our mission to provide access to our, our cultural record. Um, and you know, here's, here's how you can learn more. Um, I think that also we need to provide um, uh, ways for users to request removal or, or provide feedback about items uh, more easily and link to our policies and procedures. So um, next slide. So there's uh, just some further reading here uh, if you're interested in engaging with this a little bit more. Um, but back to you, Liz. All right, thank you very much, Evan. We are going to move on now to our next presentation from Jane Kelly. Jane is the Records and Accessioning Archivist at Tufts Digital Collections and Archives. Prior to that, 
she was the web archiving assistant for the hashtag me Too digital media collection at the Schlesinger Library. In that role, she identified material for inclusion in the collection, conducted web crawls, created descriptive metadata, and researched issues related to ethics in social media archiving. She received her MSLIS at the iSchool at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in 2018, and I will turn this over to Jane. Thank you, Liz. Um, and good morning, everyone, and thank you all so much for being here with us today. Uh, my name is Jane Kelly. I use she, her pronouns. And prior to joining Tufts Digital Collections and Archives, um, I was fortunate enough to get to work on the Me Too Digital Media Collection at the Schlesinger Library as the web archiving assistant on that project. Um, so the Schlesinger Library, for those of you who might not be familiar, uh, collects resources on the history of women in America with particularly strong holdings in women's rights and feminism, health and sexuality, work and family life, education and the professions, and culinary history and etiquette. So in 2017, when the Me Too movement began, it seemed like a natural collecting area for the library. Um, after securing grant funding in 2018, the library was able to hire me to come onto the project to work with the digital services team to collect websites and tweets related to Me Too. Um, so you can think of this project, just to give you a little bit of background, um, as having two main collecting threads. The first is a curated collection of websites and web pages, and the second is Twitter data obtained using the Twitter API. Now, my first goal as a member of the project team was to do a broad literature review of ethics as it relates to web archiving and digital collecting. Um, the purpose of this research was really to craft an ethics statement that would help guide the project and, um, from my perspective, help me personally make choices about what to include or exclude from the web archives. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so today I want to address two related questions that I grappled with uh, throughout my work on this project. First, are we justified in creating digital collections of materials that may never have been intended for preservation or widespread dissemination? And even if we are, at least in some cases, how then do we make ethical decisions about what to include? Uh, so before our project team really ramped up collecting, I did a lot of research related to ethics in social media archiving, digital preservation, internet research, um, and a bunch of related fields and topics that already sort of had established ethics frameworks. Um, and what I really came away with as I helped craft an ethics statement and a framework for how I would approach my own work um, is that we really have to emphasize that what is legal is not the same as what is ethical. Um, and that doesn't necessarily align in either of those cases with what content creators expectations are. Um, so today I'm going to briefly address two theories of privacy um, that I was not familiar with prior to this project, um, and that I found really useful in my decision-making process for identifying content to include in the collection. Um, the first is a contextual approach to privacy, and the second is a social networks theory of privacy. So next slide, please. Um, so Helen Niesenbaum, a professor of information science at Cornell Tech, established in 2004 what she called privacy as contextual integrity. And she wrote that a central tenet of contextual integrity, a theory developed by social theorists, is that there are no arenas of life not governed by norms of information flow. Almost everything, things that we do, events that occur, transactions that take place, happens in a context not only of place, but of politics, convention, and cultural expectation. So with this in mind, we can't just assume a sort of uh, public versus private dichotomy. Um, or to reframe this in the world of social media, we can't just ask if someone's blog posts or blog content is public or private before we make a decision to capture it. So in my work on this project, it was important for me to try to understand, or at least intuit as best I could, uh, content creators' expectations of privacy and anonymity on the web. So what social media users think is legal may not be correct, but I think we're still compelled to consider their understanding of behavioral norms on the web. Um, so for instance, there was a 2018 survey whose results were published in the article, Participant Perceptions of Twitter Research Ethics, 
Um, and that revealed that the majority of respondents, at least to that survey, not only don't know that researchers use public tweets in their work, but they also believe that researchers should not be able to do so without permission. Uh, so Nissenbaum expanded on her 2004 work in a 2011 article, A Contextual Approach to Privacy Online. Um, and she recommends that we, that in looking at our online activity, we try to look for familiar contours of social activity and structures that we already know. Um, and when there's not an obvious counterpart to the offline world, we need to work to establish norms. And I believe that we need to acknowledge that the web is a really complicated space, uh, particularly in terms of complex, you know, uh, legal issues and terms of service that people really don't, for one, thing read or for another thing understand. Um, and we, we need to take that into consideration in our own decision making process. Um, next slide, please. Um, so alongside considering content creators personal context and level of understanding of privacy on the web, I also took social networks into account. Um, so a social networks theory of privacy prompts us to ask if we can reasonably evaluate the number, depth, and breadth of connections that users have on the web to inform our collecting decisions. So content creators will presumably have different expectations regarding their privacy based on their presumed reach. And this goes even if someone's content is public. Um, someone who has 20 Twitter followers or a video that has 15 views on YouTube is going to have vastly different expectations than someone with thousands or millions of followers and views. Um, and so this framing made it easier for me to include or exclude certain kinds of content. Um, so for instance, I can assume a celebrity who shares a Me Too story knows that their words have a wide reach, whereas someone who posts a video on YouTube that's maybe only been seen a handful of times is not going to expect that many people have seen or heard their story, not to mention an archivist sort of trolling around looking for material to include um, in a project like this one. So depending on the content of that kind of video, I might decide that it isn't appropriate to capture the content unless I can connect with that individual directly to secure their permission. Uh, slide, please. Um, so even once we've worked through these questions of what can ethically be included in our collection, um, we still need to think about technical obstacles, I think particularly in the case of web archives. Um, so many web archives, particularly in my experience, at least um, institutional archives, tend to lack metadata um, at the level of a website or individual URL. Um, there might be description at the collection level, but that isn't always going to be enough to fully contextualize a blog post uh, or a series of tweets um, closer to the item level. And so I found myself wondering if we need to provide meaningful context for users to make sense of specific content in the collection in the future, what portion of a website needs to be captured? And how difficult is it to capture that content? And do our tools allow us to do so? And even if they do, how much staff time, troubleshooting, and data is it going to take uh, to complete that work? Um, so these are some questions that might change our answer from yes, include this in the collection, to no, this is not feasible. Um, so even if we can ethically justify inclusion, uh, we might not be able to justify it from sort of technical or staff time perspectives. Uh, slide, please. Um, and so I always like to end talk, talks like these um, by circling back to Tarana Burke's work um, and her idea of empowerment through empathy. Um, and her words um, and sort of speaking and writing about this um, encouraged me, sort of inspired me to think about this in the context of my own work as an archivist. Um, and so to bring that into archives and libraries, I want us all to think about whether or not our work empowers individuals and communities. And if it doesn't, uh, how can we advocate for changing our practices to ensure that this is possible? Um, and so of course, the answers to these questions are going to vary based on whatever our project or goal is. Um, but I think it's really important that we keep uh, these kinds of ideas in mind as we do our work in the day to day. Uh, last, next slide, please. Um, I have a select bibliography for you here, um, and the full Zotero library um, is available through our project website. Um, I'll leave this here for just a moment so you can take a look. Um, and last slide, please. 
Um, and I, I just want to thank you all for your time today, as well as the you know, past and present project uh, team members who I worked with um, and supported me in this work. Um, and I'd really encourage you to take a look at our project website and our archive collection. Uh, we would always love to get feedback from people. Um, so thank you. Um, and I look forward to hearing from our last panelist and hearing uh, from all of you. Thank you very much, Jane. That was fabulous. We are going to move on to our final speaker in this panel, Elizabeth Watts Pope, who is curator of books and digitized collections at the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester, Massachusetts. Her work aims to connect people to their history by, by providing access to printed and digitized sources, especially focusing on underdocumented groups. Elizabeth promotes, makes accessible, and builds upon the strengths of the Society's unparalleled collection of early American books and pamphlets, and works closely with digitization partners to make the AAS material as widely available as possible. She has also worked at the Center at the University of Connecticut and holds an MA in History from the University of Connecticut. Elizabeth. Hello, thank you all for joining us today. I hope you're all coping well with these uh, strange times that we are living in. I don't know about you, but stopping all our daily routines so completely and abruptly has caused me at least some existential angst. Um, why do we do what we do? Who is it for? Uh, academics, community activists, future generations? And if our work really is for people, how might it change things if we actually started out our projects by engaging the people who might use them? We could think of this as user-driven design or as putting the humanity back in our work. Engaging people rather than just assuming that we know what will be wanted or needed is especially important for projects relying on material from underdocumented groups. Otherwise our institutions and we ourselves run the risk of actually recolonizing rather than decolonizing the archive when we uncritically represent it in digital form. We may be reinscribing the inequities found in our collections and our institutions and essentially reifying them in digital form. And we may be promoting ourselves or our institutions by making a name for ourselves off the labor of others, whether those people are the physical historical figures, excuse me, whose collections we work with, or all the scholars, librarians, bibliographers, and catalogers who've worked with the material over the intervening years, or those who are working with us on projects now, such as interns, advisory committees, and more. So this morning, I'd like to talk with you about some practical steps we can take to make our digital projects more humane, humble, and honest. And I'll try to model these virtues myself, drawing on practical examples from two projects we are in the midst of developing at the American Antiquarian Society. Next slide, please. For both of these projects, I'll just note, AAS has started a small initial project to get something tangible done, and also started an advisory group to help us think bigger picture, both at the same time. And we can talk more about the value, but also the pitfalls of such a continual feedback loop. But the first project I wanted to mention is our Black Self-Publishing. Uh, it's a collaborative research project that is based on a working list of self-published materials by early African Americans. Its current form is as the website that was developed by an AAS intern. And we want it to model collaborative scholarship between librarians, communities of color, activists, and scholars. And so we're in the process of recruiting learning partners, uh, basically teaching partners who can use the um, website in their work and also forming an advisory group to help us plan how to best use and then develop this project into the future. Next please. The other project area I want to talk to you about is our indigenous initiatives at AAS. We are, um, these are being led by my colleague Kim Tony, and some of the projects include a website that Kim has already completed, um, which is pictured here on Algonquin language text and we also just received a grant to partner with scholars in the Nipmuc Nation to digitize material relevant to their heritage. And we would like to expand on this work to digitize more of our indigenous language materials held at the society. Next, please. So uh, based on these projects, uh, this is an idea I didn't include on my list, but I would say it's important to start organically with people that you already know or areas you already have strengths in. In our case, AAS is known for our work on the history of printing, hence our interest in black books and self-publishing. We also have an excellent collection of indigenous language materials. Another thing to think about is who you already know, the people and connections that you've made. 
Kim, my colleague, is part of the Nipmuc Nation and AAS is on Nipmuc land, so it made sense for us to start there with our Indigenous initiatives. Myself, I had started presenting work on AAS's Hawaiiana collections and through that had connected with amazing scholars from Hawaii. So we're reaching out to folks on the islands about possible digitization projects there. Next, please. But while we want to start from a solid home base, uh, we really need to stretch out to new communities. And thus, it's absolutely essential in these projects to actively seek advice and to continue to incorporate feedback. All of the advisory groups that AS has convened thus far say the same thing. Go to where the people are. Don't wait for them to come to you. Share a table with others at Indigenous Scholars Conferences and make new friends there. For the Black Self-Publishing Project, we're reaching out to HBCUs, historically Black colleges and universities. And these type of outreach activities have the continuing benefit of bringing new people into the orbit of your organization. And they also make, uh, help you find good partners who will make or break your project. Building this cohort of advisors and interested parties is absolutely essential if you want to foreground your work, how your work will actually be used by people. And it's just one example with the NIPUC people, um, they're doing language reclamation work and seeking federal and have been seeking federal, not just state recognition. When I was first thinking about this project, I thought we would be talking with them about um, digitizing printed indigenous language materials, but they specifically requested certain manuscript materials, which are, are what we are starting with. So it's always important to ask what people actually uh, want and need to use from your collection. Now, getting advice on your project is one thing, incorporating it and continuing to solicit and incorporate that feedback is much more important if we were to avoid the issues of tokenism or shallow or self-serving projects. So these larger conversations are built on relationships developed over years and mutual trust and respect in each other's expertise. Next, please. It's also critically important to examine blind spots in ourselves. AAS is creating protocols, and in fact, Kim is working at home on these, from at home on these now. Um, and uh, AAS has done some training, and we plan to do more on diversity and accessibility issues. Facing what we don't know can be hard for knowledge professionals, and no one wants to believe they are ignorant or admit that they are wrong. And I'll just speak for myself here, um, but I think it's important for us to acknowledge these moments in our own lives. I'm not proud to admit that I had been glad that AAS had divested itself of Native American artifacts that had been collected earlier in our history. Um, we divested ourselves of them early in the 20th century. And I stupidly took that to mean we did not have a continuing responsibility regarding these items. One of our scholars' more recent work has made clear to me the obvious fact that we really had compounded the offense of taking and dislocating the original objects by then failing to accurately track their sources, provenance, and their ultimate destination of these objects. So uh, we have to be willing to see ourselves as part of the problem if we are ever to have an effect on changing things. Next, please. I'm just gonna breeze through these last ones so that we have plenty of time for discussion. Uh, respecting the original context is also important. Uh, my colleagues have already spoken about that earlier, but I'll just exact I'll add one example from my own experience in thinking about AAS's Hawaiian language materials. I had been thinking an essential future step in this project would be to translate these materials into English so that they would have a wider audience. However, in talking with Hawaiian scholars about their own work, it was emphasized to me that there, there's a generation of scholars now coming of age who grew up speaking Hawaiian or um, learning in Hawaiian on the islands. So why shouldn't the digitized sources they rely on in their scholarship be framed in their own original language, in this case, Hawaiian? even if there is uh, eventually offered a secondary translation into English. Next, please. Another thing we wanna be wary of are the assumptions in our metadata. And we heard a really excellent discussion of this from uh, Ms. Westbrooks earlier. Um, the advisors at AAS have stressed to us the importance of working with indigenous programmers and librarians of color whenever possible. In other words, it's not just the content of our project, but the infrastructure around it that needs to be rethought and it may need to be restructured when we're attempting to decolonize the archive. How might conceiving of a project in its original language change the way we structure our data, the subject headings we use, and how we organize our content? Next, please. Another important aspect is, um, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I skipped ahead. Um, another important aspect is to work in stages. Uh, creating a project in stages is important um, 
because projects never go exactly as planned. And it's important to have various off ramps where you can still have something that you can show to people that they can actually use for all the effort that goes into um, one of these projects. Because if you're continually seeking advice and then incorporating the feedback from um, your advisors, you may find that the direction you'd plan to take this project in is not helpful and you may be advised to stop. And we have to be willing to do that. And having a clearly de delineated stopping point makes your project more um, helpful when you do have to stop it. And finally, um, honoring the work of others is another key thing that's come out of my own work. Paying for it, paying for the work of others, acknowledging it everywhere you can. Uh, we need to hire and engage those who will be using the collection material, especially people whose cultural heritage the work is based on. And we should model in our own funding and government structure, governance structure, and even our website design, the values that we want our project to promote. Next, please. So I'm out of time, but I just wanted to, in the spirit of honoring the works of others, um, I wanted to mention another project, the Colored Conventions Project. And uh, they have done some excellent work, really well modeled and thoughtfully constructed collaborative project. And they've listed the principles they base their work on. Um, so I urge you to check out that website. Um, and they, if you can go to the next slide, please. They also are basing their work on earlier work. Uh, they acknowledge their debt to earlier eco-justice models, including these principles for democratic organization. So um, I will conclude now so that we have time to talk more. You can go to the next slide. And I'll just close by saying thank you very much. And um, I think this work is so important, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And this is what makes it really meaningful to actually do these structural changes um, is going to be, you'll have pushback and, and um, it's painful sometimes to us, but we need to, uh, it's work that needs to be done. And I look forward to talking with you all more about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. We are going to stop with the screen share and all four, myself and all three of the panelists are here present. And what we will do now, if each of the panelists could unmute yourselves, that'd be great. What we'd like to do now is to have the panelists respond to a question that I've been considering and mulling over as I looked at these presentations in advance and thought about the big theme of this conference. I'm going to ask a question. Each of our panelists will respond and then we will open up to the wider Q&A from the audience at large. So the question I'd like us to explore is this. Each of the presentations and projects presented just now circle around the ideas of empowerment and advocacy in various ways. And all of them take as a central concern the needs and expectations of the communities you serve, communities of donors, scholars, students, and those who are connected to the archival material under consideration in a number of, of different ways. With that in mind, and thinking about our wide audience here today, what one piece of advice would you have for others in the archives world who are just starting or trying to start the process of adjusting their development and digitization plans to better serve these varied communities? Well, I'll um, jump in. One of the, this is Elizabeth Pope. Um, one of the things I mentioned was the uh, working in stages in my list. And I think that that um, aspect is, is really important important, uh, more than you might think, because uh, it also, uh, besides the reasons I mentioned in my talk, it also gives you an opportunity to have something um, actually done that's available that you can show to your advisors and to other people that they can respond to. Um, and this helps because uh, it's rather than just going to people saying, you know, tell us what you want and putting the entire burden of creating a project and, and um, doing the intellectual work behind that on somebody, it's helpful, I think, to start with, here's what we have. Um, let's present it to you in a form that's useful, that we think might be useful, and then get that feedback and, and start that feedback loop. So I think working in stages and finding out this works, this doesn't work, um, here's where we have to stop, here's where our funding stops. Uh, realistically, these are the things that happen. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think 
with the Black Self Publishing site, we were able to have something up that's physically accessible, not physically, but digitally accessible. And um, people can go there and take a look at it and better understand if it's something they can use in their classroom. And with the Indigenous Languages Project, one of the things we've done recently is send a list of um, Hawaii language titles that we have in our collections we're interested in digitizing to our contacts in Hawaii to see if there is interest in that, if that's something that would be useful or not. So those staged approaches can help. Yeah, I think um, I have, I guess, two things that I'd like to, to contribute. Um, the first kind of gets back to Elaine's, one of Elaine's points in her keynote um, this morning is that there's really no shortcut, um, particularly when it comes to building trust with the community um, and sort of establishing trust with folks who might be represented in your collections or who are donors or potential donors. Um, and I, I think it can be hard to appropriately build in the time in terms of sort of managing your actual project um, and sort of responding to these external deadlines that you might have at your institution. Um, but that that's not going to be something that you can get done in a couple of days. Um, and I think we all need to bear in mind that our sort of individual good work um, as staff members at our institutions um, doesn't erase what our institution has done in the past or might represent um, historically or presently. Um, and I think the, the second thing that speaks a little bit more to what Elizabeth was just talking about um, is figuring out what your donors um, and others or constituents actually want and need from you. Um, what I learned on, in this project and sort of um, other work that I've done with student collecting um, is that it was really important, I think, for me to learn how to reframe what we can do for people um, in terms that are actually meaningful to them. Um, because we all know what we're good at as archivists and librarians, um, but that might not resonate with people um, if we're not aligning that with what is meaningful and valuable to them. Um, so something I did was, you know, in, in working with students on a, a different project was thinking about how to talk rather than, rather than about preserving your legacy, um, for instance, shifting that to something that was meaningful to them, which was sort of the, constant churn of turnover from year to year and how we could sort of support them in the here and now. Um, and so I think reframing the way we talk about what we do in order to align with what matters um, to other people is really important. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I would just, I would say that I, I think that um, I really liked, uh, Jane, you talked about the, the research you'd done about um, ethics um, and then sort of researching these frameworks uh, and, and statements and coming up with your own statement. I think that the, the thing that we don't do very much is kind of put um, administrative structures in place to deal with uh, digitizing content uh, in terms of, you know, we, we want to have, I think it, it makes sense to have, you know, uh, to have committees, to have advisory committees, uh, to especially to seek out engagement outside of the library. I think that that's something we really don't do enough um, to be intentional in terms of having procedures and policies written up uh, beforehand or, or even having a kind of like a checklist as, as you're looking at digitizing a collection that not only asks, you know, what's the value of this and, and how much time and who's going to be working on it and who's going to be doing what, um, but also uh, that idea of empowerment. Who's going to be empowered um, by this, by putting this material online and kind of weighing um, some of the, the risks and rewards of, of what you're doing. I don't think that we do that enough. And so I think that, you know, we're, we're good at figuring out the technical aspects of digitizing collections and, and describing them for the most part. But, um, you know, the, the other work of, of being um, more thoughtful about policies and procedures and having those things available before uh, before we even start, um, I think is, is really good. There's a, a couple of projects that I, in the course of the research for this talk, I stumbled across a couple of projects where basically people spent a lot of time digitizing content and then decided at the end, you know, it's not, we don't think it's ethical to put this material online and they ended up taking it down or, or not putting it online. And so, you know, if people had had those conversations up front, um, that might have saved them a lot of time and money uh, and would save you know, a lot of, lot of effort and, and anguish, I think, on people's behalf. 
Great, thank you all very much for that. We have, um, we have the better part of 10, uh, I think about 10 minutes, maybe a little bit more for Q&A from the audience at large. And I'm going to ask that our moderators who have been moderating those questions um, share with We're them. ready to go. So I'm gonna stay the discombobulated voice just so the attention can remain on our speakers. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, Jane, and Abe, um, and Eben. So the first question is for all of the speakers. What are your techniques for addressing or counteracting the power imbalances of a large institution working with less resourced communities? And I think this is just a question, each of these questions, um, panelists, if you feel so moved to respond, please just unmute yourselves and, and jump on in. We'll hopefully be able to talk with one another. I do have questions um, for individuals, but I thought I'd start off with a general question for them, for all speakers. Yeah, I'm happy to, to, to get things going with this first question. Um, I think what's really important um, is sort of what to me is the most obvious thing, which is just communicating. Um, with folks, um, and if you are at a large institution like Harvard, um, being mindful that there might be people who are not interested in participating in your project. Um, and I think we need to respect that. Um, and so I think having open lines of communication um, is really important. Um, and also patience, um, that not everyone is gonna work on our timeframe, um, our deadlines, can be very arbitrary um, or tied to things that are not um, in alignment with what other people are doing um, in their own work, whether it's in a library or a community organization. Um, and so sometimes we just need to wait. Um, and sometimes unfortunately waiting means not getting to do the thing we want to do, even if we have good intentions. Um, and so I think that communication and patience um, is, uh, is key to, to working uh, from an institution like like a Harvard. And I'll just add um, there, one of the good news is that a lot of um, funding organizations, uh, digitizing grant organizations want those kind of partnerships of um, institutions of various types, um, including those, you know, less well resourced and um, for instance, the uh, Omohundro Institute grant that uh, we got is one that we'd applied for. We tried applying the year before. So that gets to Jane's point too of um, timing isn't always gonna be exactly uh, what you want. Uh, sometimes it, it, it takes another year just because of the way things work out with different deadlines. Um, but I think pursuing uh, funding sources from outside agencies is one way to help um, get the work done that, that, that everybody wants to get done. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a lot to add on this one. I, I would say that I think the, the aspect of communicating with stakeholders that often gets most neglected is kind of after the project is over uh, or the material has been put online. And, and so Elizabeth, I like your comment about working in stages and getting feedback over time. But you know, the thing that if, you know, if you've ever written a grant report, you know that your um, part of your report is supposed to be about assessing the impact after your work is over. And that's always the part in the, in when you're writing your grant report where you're like, well, we didn't really get time to do that because we spent all our time building the project. And so we actually don't really have a great idea of its impact or, or, or uh, uh, the time to do the, the work of assessment. And so I think that putting in that time after, you know, things go online and things are digitized to go back to your stakeholders and community on a, on a periodic basis to check in and, and see if they're, you know, if they're, if they're finding what you did to be useful or, or what impact they're seeing, I think that's often something that we, that we don't do very well. Okay. I have, I have the next question for all of the panelists. Do you have secured funding for stakeholders and community members or other outsiders of traditional academia for their work on contextualization and or feedback? So um, I'll just say for AAS, um, we do have a, a, a very 
extensive fellowship program for people working with our collection material, but it includes um, not just fellowships for academics, but also we call them artist fellows, but basically it's a fellowship for anybody who's not in academia working on any kind of a project, uh, nonfiction work, we have journalists, we have playwrights, um, we have uh, painting, digital artists, you know, any, any kind of um, project that would benefit from use of our collections. So um, that is one source of funding uh, in our institution. Yeah, I, I believe um, both at the Schlesinger Library and the Radcliffe Institute um, more broadly, there are a lot of fellowship opportunities. Um, I know that um, if I remember correctly and my former Schlesinger colleagues who are here today, I hope that you can get in the chat and correct me if I'm wrong about any of this, but um, I believe there is um, a program to bring um, local high school teachers um, into the archives. Um, not necessarily to work specifically with this collection, um, but that is bringing in sort of a different constituency. Um, I think right now the main work in terms of like metadata and contextualization um, is coming from uh, staff at the library. Um, so I, I won't try to paint a rosy picture um, that we've done an unusually good job of, of bringing sort of non-traditional um, uh, constituencies into the library specifically on this project. Yeah, I, I, um, I don't, I don't know of anything that we do currently, um, at BPL around that. Um, I, I have, I think that's a great question. Um, I have worked on projects in the past. Uh, I was, I was on a digitization project related to, um, oral histories, uh, from Holocaust survivors, uh, in a, in a previous job. And when we were, building the archive, we had the idea that we were going to have um, commentary from, from scholars be part of the online presentation. And, and we were really naive, honestly, in thinking like, wow, this material that we're putting online is so interesting and it's going to be so great for, for the scholarly community that people would just want to give us these commentaries and do this work for free. Uh, and that was a really stupid idea, to be perfectly honest. It was a real mistake that we uh, realized pretty quickly and so yeah building in that funding into grants and things like that is a is a really important point that i think definitely gets lost i'm just going to jump back in and say another um, option is uh, teachers as well um, that's something we've tried to do at aas is do um, workshops and um, programming for teachers uh, that they can then use in the classroom um, so providing digital material um, that they can then you know have printouts so they don't get to access the original necessarily but they have a you know, a version they can use either digitally or um, in the classroom. It's another way to get our get our stuff out there to new audiences, young people, you know, people who don't come into archives. Um, and so uh, teaching, and especially now with um, everybody having to do so much teaching online, um, I think that's going to be more and more of an opportunity. And I think it's smart for all of us to think, how can we help with that? And how can our collections actually be put to, to real use uh, in a daily capacity with young people or um, different tribal groups? Or There's so many different areas that we could get this material out to. I, I would actually just like to step in here for one half second to offer a thought um, coming from a university. My current situation is as a faculty member, but I collaborate quite a bit with our special collection and archives. And I've done a lot of work leading um, engagement initiatives. And I just wanted to share that a lot of a conversation that I've been having for some years is that if we are in fact going to do work, quote unquote, with communities or for communities, which is already a, a sort of fraught phrase, uh, the recognition that our work cannot happen, but for the insight, wisdom, and lived experience of other people renders already those other folks as the experts whom we, especially in an academic setting, are aware that we pay for expertise, right? So some of the conversation we've had for years now is how do you actually compensate, not just with a thank you, not just with we'll provide you lunch when you come to an advisory meeting, but what is the actual cost for the expertise um, and that experience that no one can offer us but for folks outside of our orbs um, who are the authorities on their own lived experience. So I, I just share that I think it's something that's bigger and broader than simply archives, but is, is definitely a conversation across the landscape. 
Thank you. We have about another four minutes left. And we do have some questions directed at individual speakers. Where possible, I will try to broaden it um, across the whole panel. Um, this question is for Jane. Um, with the Me Too movement, I'm sorry, with the Me Too project, wouldn't it be reasonable to assume that someone creating content under a high, under a high visibility hashtag, such as Me Too, would be either assuming or hoping that their content would be seen or become part of that narrative? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it's a question whose answer we talked about a lot. Um, and the answer is definitely sometimes yes. Um, sometimes people are using that hashtag because they're participating in this huge global conversation. Um, in other cases, I think the, the sort of contextual clues that I had um, surrounding the content, whether that be sort of the quality of the blogging platform that they were using and like the likelihood that other people were seeing it, how deeply buried this post was in a set of Google search results um, or how many views a video has. Um, sometimes that would indicate to me, I think that people did not necessarily expect that hundreds or thousands or millions of people would see their content. Um, I found lots of really um, sort of moving and interesting material on YouTube, uh, but sometimes the, the person in the video would say, you know, I haven't shared this with anyone before and I might delete this later. Um, and so when someone's setting up their uh, sort of story by saying, I might take this down, I might not want to share this, um, I think that's when, to me, I felt like I, I should not include that content in, in the web archive um, because I, I felt strongly on my work on this project that I don't want to be in the business of teaching people like a hard lesson about online privacy <laughs> um, and that what you put on the web is forever. Um, if it was clear, if it was reasonably clear to me um, that that was not their expectation. Um, and I think I kind of had to trust my instincts that if it didn't feel right, um, then maybe it's because it wasn't. Thank you. This question is for Elizabeth Pope. Can you share how you went about building a community advisory committee for building slash interpreting slash offering access to collections? And a bit about the pluses and challenges of such a committee. Keeping in mind that we've got two minutes to, um, left in the Q&A and I do have at least one more question I would like to ask. So um, Elizabeth? It's very hard. Um, you try and draw from as many sources as you can, obviously. Um, one thing I will say is if you can get some kind of funding to help, if you can form it as a larger initiative, so it's not just one project and you can get funding, you can then also try and build into that stipends for that community expertise that um, Elizabeth was talking about. So that's another thing to, to, to keep in mind. Thank you. Um, one more question for Jane. Do you request permission from all of the organizations or institutions that you web archive? Even if the organization or institution is well known and has a large online public presence, do you consider whether they serve vulnerable communities when requesting permission? Um, I'll answer this just very quickly. Um, on this project, uh, broadly speaking, we did not request permission. Um, other web archiving projects at the Schlesinger, I believe, um, did at least, I think, send either notifications or request permission um, from content creators. But uh, with this project, we did not. Thank you very much, panel A. You did fantastic.